I am today going to wrap up our series on living beyond fear because, frankly, I am tired of finding something new to be afraid of every week. <laughs> so, there's that. So, um, I want to kind of summarize, though, where, we, where we've been. Each week, we've kind of looked at a different fear, and I actually kind of was looking at them and going, well, we could face another one, but the same stuff keeps coming up. God cares for us. He's there for us, so we don't need to be afraid. Um, and fear ends up holding us back and shrinking our lives. Um, and Christina and I, as you know, moved uh, over the last two weeks. We're finally getting settled, but um, we have two cats. And I know you're not here to hear about my cats, but they make a great illustration for, for what uh, fear does to us. And one of our cats, Taz, is this big Siamese. And he was scared for maybe a couple days, and now he's like adventuring all over the house. He comes up, he gives us love all the time. He actually loves to go outside, even though we don't like him to go outside. So he's exploring the world and enjoying it um, a great deal. Meanwhile, our other cat, Chloe, is this little tiny eight pound black cat that we call a ninja because you can never see her. And especially, we've never been able to see her these past two weeks because she hides under the bed the entire time or under the dresser or behind the dryer, those are the three spots where we know to go look to make sure she's still alive. Um, but she is terrified. And as a result, her world is incredibly small right now. And she's not able to give love, she's not able to receive love because she's scared. And if we live out of our fears, we will find ourselves in a very small world, um, not receiving much of what God's life is made for. <laughs> love and living um, outside and exploring. So, um, so this thing that we've been talking about is incredibly important, and um, it's incredibly important for us not to not have fear because that's not possible. It's called living beyond our fears because we will have fears, but when we know that we're okay, when we know that we're in a good space, um, then we're able to live and enjoy the moments. I was a youth pastor first. Um, that was one of my first ministry gigs. And uh, and one of my first events I planned as a youth pastor was going to a hunted corn maze up in Snohomish, which was great fun. Um, and I was in charge of junior high and high school. And I had a parent come to me and they said, well, my son is a really young sixth grader. And I think he can handle this, but I just want you to keep an eye out for him when we go up to the corn maze. And um, and then we had it also in that group, a number of like seniors in high school, like 17 year olds. And um, so I stayed close to this, this sixth grader and his experience of the haunted corn maze, his very first haunted corn maze adventure um, was not a good one. Every time we went around another corner in these this corn maze, was a guy jumping out with a chainsaw running and and he just got terrified and he would shrink back and try and like hide behind me and I'm pretty sure he didn't enjoy any of this whole adventure. And meanwhile the seventeen year olds were having a great time. They were laughing and half the time they were chasing the chainsaw guy back into his place. And, I mean they were just they, they knew they were safe and that was the difference. Um, this sixth grader didn't know he was safe. And so he wasn't able to enjoy it, and the 17-year-olds did. Um, now, the only downside of 17 is that we think we're actually invulnerable, and um, we have no fear of anything. And today we're going to kind of flip the script and talk about what is a fear that actually is worth having. What kind of a fear might we have that might enrich our lives? Um, Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is a life well lived. That's how you can define wisdom. Um, so how does the fear of the Lord fit into that, and what does that look like? I want to I wanna dig into that a little bit. Um, there is a healthy sense of fear. We haven't talked about that. I've normally talked about fear as a negative. But when you were a small child, at some point your parents said, no, 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 don't touch the stove. And taught you to be afraid of the stove when it was on. And that was probably a healthy thing. Um, I have a nephew who is... Uh, he was really young at the time, now he's in high school. But he and his brothers, he was the youngest of three, he's really into skateboarding. And for whatever reason, the youngest one had the least fear. He has no fear of gravity or what gravity can do to you. 
And so there's videos of him like riding his skateboard at like eight years old off of a flight of stairs that's like 10, 12 steps high. And he got banged up a lot because of his lack of fear of gravity. Um, it feels like every week when I'm looking through the random news, I see somebody who decided to disobey the signs at the zoo that say don't climb over the fence. Um, there's things that it's good to be afraid of um, because they actually set out boundaries for our lives and they show us um, the places that we can live well. And I feel like the fear of the Lord is something similar to that. It enriches our lives. It shows us the full extent of full lives. And um, it's better to stand with the Lord than against him. So um, for the scripture today, we're going to look at Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to pray and uh, sit before God and, and hear what he has for us. So, um, All right, here we go. Matthew 17, 1 through 8. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light, and just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. I'll make one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a cloud, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground. They were terrified. And then Jesus came and touched them and said, Get up. He said, Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Let's pray. God, um, you are big. And you are something more than us. And so, Lord, uh, may we keep ourselves in perspective. May we have you in perspective. And may we walk uh, in recognition of your greatness and power and love. So here it is, a divinely powerful moment, an encounter with God that caught these guys by surprise. Um, it's funny, uh, high points of, of Jesus' life often happen on high points in geography, and there they are up on a mountainside, just to his closest disciples, and then Jesus shows who he is. Blazing white light coming out of his garment, coming out of his every pore. This is not the sparkle of a vampire sitting out on a field. This is um, something tremendously powerful. Um, and uh, have you ever experienced these moments that humble you? And sort of make you realize that you're not God and that God is actually much bigger than you think. Um, for me, it happens sometimes when I see a big storm. I go, whoa, okay. And that's probably small compared to God and, and here I am. Um, or admiring the stars. You look out and you see the stars and you go, you made all that? It's all just one small part. Or walking into a cathedral. I find it totally fascinating that uh, whether you're a believer or not, when people walk into a giant cathedral, they start whispering. They are impacted by the fact that this building represents something so much bigger than them. Um, it's a humbling thing to realize that God is big and that we are not. Um, have you ever met a pro football player? They're huge. They're not normal sized human beings. Like I watch on TV and I go, well, they're all kind of about the same size. And if he had done a spin move right there, he probably would have got past that guy, no problem. <laughs> I could probably do that. <laughs> and then you meet a pro football player and you go, 6'5", 250, solid muscle, it really wouldn't matter what I would try to do. There is no way I would get past that one guy, let alone all those guys. You realize you're small. And uh, I kind of think that Peter had that moment when the voice of God spoke. He was sitting there. He uh, has this incredible moment happening around him, and he sees Jesus, and then he sees uh, Moses, the giver, 
of the Ten Commandments, the writer of the first five books of the Bible, the, writer, the guy who took down the law from God while he was up on a mountain and, and gave it to the Israelites. And he goes, wow, that's, that's amazing that he's here. And then Elijah's there, the, the great prophet, and he's going, they're having a discussion about how Jesus is about to fulfill all of this when he goes to the cross. And he's like, well, uh, um, I should build something. He's like a handy guy. So he, he Jesus, I, I can build you guys a little house each if you want. While we're up here, I can set up a little shelter and we can have a nice little retreat together. And it says, while he was still speaking, God cut him off. And he goes, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now is a time not for you to keep planning and to keep building. It's a time for you to shut your mouth and listen to Jesus. There's a time in our lives to stop the franticness, to stop managing our lives, to stop um, charging ahead and hoping that God comes with us and to say, God, you are in charge. I will go with you. Um, they fell on their knees and they were terrified. And I, the fear of the Lord is sort of a, a sense of reverence and of awe and of recognition that we are in the presence of somebody much bigger than us. Now, the good news is that he loves us and he's for us. But when you're sitting there and you encounter who God really is, you realize that not listening to him, that going ahead in your own path, wherever that might lead, would be disastrous and foolish, as much as me deciding that I am going to run over that NFL football player. Um, not fearing gravity, uh, as my nephew did, can lead to crashes. Um, to stand against God is a dangerous thing. It's sort of like um, just not even caring that there's really a speed limit. I was on a trip to California. I was driving Washington to California with my friend, and I was in his car. We were driving down for spring break, and I somehow got off I-5 and onto a mountain highway road, and um, speed limit signs are popping up, and they just had gone from 60 to 30, and I didn't really understand why. I thought I was still on I-5, <laughs> so I just ignored them and figured, we got to get down there. Uh, more time on the beach. So I was driving at 60 miles an hour into mountain curves, and my friend was asleep on the back seat of his car while I was in charge of driving. And um, man, we hit that first curve at full speed, and the car began to slide over towards the mountainside, and we hit the dirt, and you could feel it vibrating. And, and my buddy woke up, and he looks out the window, and he sees the cliff like the mountain. They're getting closer and closer to him. Thankfully, we didn't hit it. We continued to slide a little bit, and I got control of the car and slowed down. Um, and he said, I don't even want to know what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> proceeded to go back to sleep. But in that moment, I had chosen to just keep doing my thing. Um, and I had ignored the laws that were there that could... Uh, lead to some serious trouble and to stand against God and to not see him as the center and to do our thing is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Um, when God is at the center, when we are not at the center, suddenly life begins to make more sense. Our purpose and our place in life begins to make more sense. The strength um, that we could have if we walked with the Lord begins to make sense. The resources that are there for us to tackle life begin to make more sense. Um, if we always believe that God was simply there just to help us, and that maybe he's at equal power with the world or something, um, he's not much more than a buddy Jesus, or a puppy dog Jesus, as one of my seminary professors told us. Somebody to make us feel better, you know? He's there. Or like, uh, like I have this little... Um, Jesus on a spring, sort of like bobblehead Jesus. And um, I know of somebody who kept one in his car. This wasn't me, but um, kept one in his car so that he could kind of give it a little tap whenever he needed a parking spot. And it was his way of asking Jesus to give him a parking spot. And um, I love the fact that he's interacting with Jesus on a regular basis, but something tells me that God's plan for the world is somehow bigger than giving us a parking spot. Um, we're not equal with God. God is bigger than us. And his plans for the world are bigger than us. And when we begin to get that, um, something happens. We get recentered. We get in place. Um, 
It's a little bit like the sun revolving around the earth. You know, Galileo had this whole crazy idea that maybe the earth is not actually the center of the universe and everything is revolving around it. And, um, and at some point he began to discover that actually the sun is much bigger than the earth. And as a result, the earth is revolving around it. Um, there is something very powerful in our lives when we discover that God is the sun and that everything in the universe is revolving around him and that we are one small part of what he's up to. It's humbling, but it puts things in perspective. And when we recognize our smallness, um, it can be scary. When we realize that God is big and that we are not, uh, that's intimidating. But the thing about scripture is it never separates God's love for us from his um, largeness. I want to read another passage, Matthew 10, um, 28 through 31, where Jesus speaks of what the fear of the Lord is. Um, Matthew 10, 28 through 31. He says this, um, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both your soul and your body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. Get it? Now don't be afraid. Yes, you're in the presence of something bigger than you, but don't be afraid because you are worth more than sparrows. God loves us. He cares for us deeply. And he's very big and very strong. And when those two ideas come together, when that coin that is both sides, God is big and powerful and God loves us very much, when those two things come together, we realize that we have someone who is with us and on our side that is so much bigger than anything that life can throw at us. When I was 14, I moved from uh, California in the middle of the school year to Seattle. And I lived in Ventura, California. It was a very comfortable upper middle class, mostly white school. Um, and we were just like a little beach town. And then I came to Seattle and it was mandatory busing to try to do racial uh, diversity within the schools. And I ended up going to Garfield High School from living in Wallingford. And I remember taking the bus and I remember sitting on that bus for a very long time. And as we went further south, I go, we are no longer in a good neighborhood. <laughs> and I begin to see more and more graffiti pop up. And then I saw my school, and it's this brick building perched up on a hill with metal across all the windows so that they can't get broken from the outside. And it reminds me a lot of what a jail would probably look like. And uh, it was scary, and the campus was covered with uh, graffiti. And as I walked in, there were crowds of people dressed all in a particular color and other people dressed in a different color. And it was very clear to me that there was probably some gangsters who are actually part of the school. And here I was like a buck 15 and uh, tiny. I mean, I was a little 14 year old. I did cross country running. I was skinny so I could run away from everybody. Um, and I was sitting there terrified. And I had a reason to be terrified. I mean, at one point, one of these guys decided to hit me with his book bag, and he hit me in the head. And I, there was literally nothing I could do about it. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll be your punching bag. That's fine. And I just kept going down the hall, um, and I was terrified. I was shrinking back, going, please don't let anybody see me or talk to me. Just let me get through this day. And then I finally hit geometry class, and I sat there, and I could do math really well, and I sat next to a guy who was on the basketball team. Now Garfield has a very good basketball team, or at least did. Like one state championships, we had NBA people coming and looking at some of our high school people. And I was sitting next to one of the guys who was the captain of the basketball team. And he stunk at math, but he really needed the math class. And he noticed that when the teacher would call on me, I'd do the math problem right then and just spit it out and that I was pretty good at this. And so he said, hey, you're new here, right? How about I watch out for you, introduce you to some people, and you help me with my math? Great deal for both of us, frankly. He didn't have to do hardly anything to get help with his math. And uh, I got it in at the school. But as I walked around, I knew that if anybody messed with me, they were going to have to deal with him. 
and that he had my back and that he had connections for me and that I was going to be okay. And suddenly I was walking around, not quite strutting, but definitely <laughs> held head, head held high, not really worried anymore. I had my place and it was doing math for the basketball team. Okay. Um, <laughs> but here's the point. As the disciples came down off that mountain, after they sat with Jesus, after they saw who he was, after they saw this brilliant, bright cloud around them saying, this is my son whom I love. You are with him. Do you think they were worried? Were they fearful about the same things that they'd been fearful about? No, I think they honestly walked and were like, wow, we're in the presence of greatness. We are in the presence of power, and we get to be along for the ride. That is what it is to discover the bigness and the care and the love of God. We no longer need to be afraid. Matthew 6, 32 and 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be given to you. The other part of being recentered around this very big God is to realize that he does have a plan. He knows what he's doing with our lives. And um, when we hop on board with him, um, it is a bit like trading in a sailboat for a motorboat. Um, I did a little bit of sailing growing up on my little beach town, like little tiny boats, like six to eight feet. And you, you would go down, and there was nothing worse than a beautiful sunny day. And you get down to the harbor, and you get your boat all ready, and you do all the knots and everything, and then you're sitting in the boat, and there is nothing happening. No wind whatsoever. Or worse, a wind that's pushing you back in towards the shore, because you really would rather go the other direction, and you would have to try and navigate away from wherever the wind wasn't, and... Um, when we live according to our fears, we end up feeling pushed in a particular direction and it's generally away from where God wants us to be, and we're sort of stuck. When you have a motorboat, you don't care what the wind is doing very much, because you know that you have more power than just what a sail can do for you. You can go wherever it is that the boat is going. Now, the brilliant thing about being on this ride with God is that we don't get to drive the boat, so we're not in charge, but he does have power for us. And so as we um, kind of wrap up the series, as we move forward in our lives, we will still have fear. We will still be like little Chloe, hiding at times. We will still encounter things that we go, I don't know if I want to risk that, because if I do, something might happen. But the beautiful thing is that God has power and he is with us and he is in charge. And if we go with him, he gets to drive the boat and he also gives us the strength to go into things. So what do we do with this? Um, first, I think we choose to put God at the center. We choose to align ourselves with him because frankly, he's going to win in the end. Mm -hmm. And to stand against him is a bad idea. It's a little bit like teams were looking at the Seahawks a couple years ago going, shoot, we got to play them. Um, we don't want to be in a position where we go, oh, I have to go against God on this one. Uh, I, I heard an ad for a mortgage company um, that sort of set itself up around Christian principles. I don't know if they're Christian or not. Um, but during the whole housing uh loaning thing. They could have made a lot of money doing a lot of sketchy loans, but they said, no, we have to do this the right way. And as a result, they have continued to grow, whereas lots of other companies went bankrupt in the process. And even if they weren't doing it just out of God, something similar happens when we have enough fear of the Lord to say, I'm not going to stand against him. I'm going to go with him. God then leads us into the places that he wants us the second thing that we can do is, as we encounter fears, we can run to them. Whatever it is that you encounter this week or in the next few weeks or whatnot, that you find yourself fearful of, that you find yourself saying, how am I going to manage this? Try and take a pause and go, I'm going to let God manage this with me. Lord, what do you want to do here? What do you want me to do here? Slow down. Stop the franticness. Pause. Stop trying to build and plan and just listen. Which kind of brings us to the last thing, and that is that we regularly need moments where we get recentered. 
we need to stop the noise. We need to stop planning and building. It's one of the beauties of having this worshiping community together. We get a set time. We get Sundays at 10 o'clock to kind of pause and get recentered. But as I was sitting here um, worshiping with you all, I was thinking, this is a great hour, but I don't know if it's enough. I think I probably need to stop and slow down and listen, maybe on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And so um, I just encourage you to find ways to do that. I don't know how you do it. I don't know if it's going out for a hike or listening to worship music or silence and prayer or having a great conversation over a meal with, with a good friend who you can talk about the Lord with. I don't, I don't know what it is. We're all wired a bit differently, but we need these moments where we stop and are small before a God who is very big, very powerful, and who loves us very much. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Let's pray. God, thanks that you are indeed large and in charge. We live in a world um, where sometimes that doesn't look like it's the case. And thanks for reminding us. Thanks for moments where you um, catch us by surprise, where we get humbled and we take our breath away. Um, give us those moments. Help us to recognize that we are not on our own, but also help us to recognize that we are not in charge and that were we to stand against you, it's a dangerous road to walk on. But were we to walk with you, we have absolutely nothing to fear because you are with us. God, thanks for your deep love for us. We love you too. Amen. Amen.